Today we're talking about the unconditional gratitude that changes the conditions of life. The paradox is that to the extent that you allow conditions to be what they are and bring your gratitude to those conditions, then you experience unconditional joy, unconditional peace, unconditional healing, unconditional life, unconditional prosperity. But it's up to you to make up your mind that in this moment you're going to say, Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Together. Thank, thank you, God. God. Thank, thank you, God. God. Thank, thank you, God. God. Moving from the traditional idea of life. It's got to be this way. It's got to be that way. If I don't get exactly what I want, I'm going to be unhappy. I'm not going to like it. It's just, well, let me read to you my favorite new magazine, Bad Mood Magazine. <laughs> Entertainment for the cranky and irritable. How to hold a grudge for years. How to inflict your moods on others. Honking incessantly in traffic. Withholding tips in restaurants. Whining and dining. Advanced sulking. Constant nagging. Pointing out faults. Special feature. 273 ways of saying, I don't like it. <laughs> and you know, what do you do when you don't like it? Well, you don't have to like it. I don't have to like it, together. I don't have to like it. I just give thanks, together. I just give thanks. Remember a unity minister years ago having the audacity of saying, you should be happy all the time, and if you're not happy all the time, there's something wrong with you. I later found out that he had multiple addictions. Hello? It's not about liking or disliking. It's not about your moods. Remember what Brother David Steindl Rask defined as meditation. Meditation is nothing more or less than observing your mind and moods for a few minutes. And so what are your moods? How do you, what, what do you see there? Then you say, what good is that going to do me? I don't like the mood I'm in. You don't have to like it. I don't have to like it. Together? I don't have to like it. I don't have to like it when Uncle George shows up at Thanksgiving. Together? I don't have to like it when Uncle George shows up on Thanksgiving. Whatever it is that's going on in your life, whatever seems to be happening to you, gratitude can happen through you. And it's like that kingdom of heaven consciousness we were talking about last week. It's that leavening that invisible something that enters into the loaf and it increases the good, making it your life more palatable, more tasty. You know, that's one thing about Chicago. We got the best bread I've ever tasted. I mean, rye bread, Lithuanian and Polish and Romanian, all these things. Unbelievable bread. Why? Because the leavening enters into it. And it's so simple and it's so plain, but it's so good. And your life... You don't have to wait for your life to change for you to bring your gratitude to it and to experience a different experience of it. What does it say in The Course of Miracles? Uh, infinite patience produces immediate results. And so if you, 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 you bring your patience to life. You bring your gratitude to life. And then the results do show up, but they don't necessarily show up exactly the way you dictate. And that's the thing you got to let go of. Letting things be exactly as they are. What about when you are driving along and you see something that upsets you on the road? What if you're driving along and you see an accident? Jason gave me permission to share with you what he does. I notice that anytime there's um, an accident, where there's emergency vehicles by the side of the road, or there's an ambulance, he, he would close his eyes and his lips would move. And I'd say, Jason, what are you saying? And he finally told me, and I asked him if I could record it and play it for you. Thank you, God, for blessing the people in the ambulance. Thank you, God, for healing them physically, mentally, and spiritually. Thank you, God, that everything happens in divine order. Thank you, God. Amen. Hmm. Wow. So, so what do you do? What do you do? The, uh, I remember the one time I heard Elizabeth Kubler-Ross speak. She told about a woman who she knew well who had, had a near-death experience. She had an accident by the side of the road, been declared dead. They put the sheet over her head. But her soul was, as you often hear in these stories, hovering above the scene and was very aware, hypersensitive of the consciousness, the mood of the people who were driving by. Very aware that the, many of the people were kind of having that rubbernecking, ghoulish kind of uh, fascination. Others were, were disturbed by it. There was all these different emotions they felt, but there one, one particular car, there was a light coming forth. A light. And they felt such a sense of well-being and harmony. And they realized in their state... That person's praying for me. 
that person's praying for me. So in their non-physical state with the sheet over their body, with their eyes closed, already declared dead, they memorized the license plate, and when they came to and were resuscitated, they went to their friend at the Department of Motor Vehicles and did an illegal trace, found out where the person lived, and knocked on their door and asked, do you remember this accident? Yes, I do. Well, I felt this experience. They said, well, I always pray for people. Whenever I see an accident, I always pray for them. Wow. How many people in this room pray for people when they see an accident? Oh, Don't be surprised if you get a knock on your door. <laughs> so, so this is the gratitude. Unconditional living. Unconditional living does create better conditions, but that's not why you do it. You, you just love. You just give. You just heal. Jesus didn't do what he did in order to receive thanks, but the thanks was very helpful to the person who gave the thanks. Now, Jesus happened to be journeying to Jerusalem and passed through the middle of Samaria. Samaria was where the foreigners lived, where the people of the different group, different religion, they were blasphemers who believed that God lived on Mount Gerizim, not in Jerusalem in the temple. They were the people who spoke differently, they, they acted different, they were the people that everyone looked down on. That's why Jesus, we think good Samaritans, Samaritans were good. No, that's why Jesus often used Samaritans in his parables. As he was entering this village in Samaria, he was met by ten men with leprosy who stood at a distance and raised their voices, saying, Master Jesus, you have pity on us. And seeing them, he said, Now go show yourself to the priests. And what happened next was that as they went on their way, they were cleansed. One of them, though, seeing that he'd been healed, came back glorifying with a loud voice, fell on his face at Jesus' feet, thanking him. And this man was a Samaritan. Jesus responded, weren't all ten of you cleansed? So where are the other nine? Wasn't anyone seen returning to give glory but this one foreigner? And he said to him, you get up, you go on your way. Your faith has made you whole. Your faith has made you whole. Your gratitude has probably made it stick. Because who knows what happened to the other ten, but you know that it stuck with this guy. He was bringing his gratitude to the situation, but Jesus didn't do what he did in order to get thanks. But he realized that the power of thanksgiving was healing. The power of thanksgiving entered into the circumstance and increased the good. The power of thanksgiving was that incredible transformative power that we have the right, the divine right and privilege, the responsibility and the great opportunity to bring to every situation. One of my favorite affirmations is, I am grateful for this opportunity. I'm grateful for this opportunity. Whenever something's going on that's kind of weird and wonky, I say, I, I thank you, God. I'm grateful for this opportunity because I'm grateful for the chance to rise up above it. I'm grateful for the chance to show my metal, what I'm made of. I'm grateful for the chance of meeting it and not doing it perfectly. See, that's the thing. When you're observing, you stand back. You're the observer. What you get to experience is the soul of you. You see... Your moods go up and down. You like things, you dislike things. You don't have to like it. Circumstances go your way or don't go your way. You, whatever's going on out there, but there's that which is observing it. What is that? That's your soul. You want to get to know your soul? The soul that you came in with, the soul that you will leave with, the soul that you were here to develop your awareness of, your spiritual growth, you want to know it? Become the observer. If you take a dedicated time for it, that's called meditation. That's a very good thing to do. Many of us do that. But even when you're just going around day by day, moment by moment, lifting out of the circumstance and then watching it, observing it, saying, okay, I don't have to like this. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Whatever's going on. You know, I remember one of the most powerful experiences that happened to me, and I've shared this before, was when my dad was dying. I just was going through a divorce. It was 1978. I was miserable, and I was standing in line at the grocery store near my mom's house, where my dad was, you know, there in bed at, at the house. And I had a few minutes, and as I was stood in line, the line didn't move fast, so there was some religious books that were on um, a stand, and one of them said, uh, Praise Works. And it was, a, it was a very conservative religious book, but it had one interesting thought. Whatever's going on, just say, Thank you, God. And it said that in Thessalonians, if Paul didn't say, For all things give thanks. He said, In all things give thanks. So just whatever's going on, just give thanks. And then it told, told all these stories about people's experiences, where often circumstances would shift. And so I started doing that. And I had that experience in a limited sense, and I found that I was lifted up. 
I was lifted up. When I went through all those experiences, I just would say, thank you, God, thank you, God, thank you, God. Together, thank, thank you, God, God, thank you, God, thank you, God. God. You don't have to like it. You don't have to approve of it. You don't have to anything. You just bring your gratitude to it. That is the kingdom of heaven consciousness, the leavening that enters into the dough, the loaf of life, and then increases the good. And that is an incredible spiritual experience. And it's unconditional living. You no longer are enslaved to circumstances. Circumstances are going to be what they are. You bring yourself to them. And then sometimes the circumstances will shift in the now moment. 1972, I was hitchhiking cross country in San Marcos, Texas. It's 107 degrees. I hadn't eaten in 18 hours. Somebody let me out because, you know, if you're hitchhiking, if they ate, you ate, and if they didn't, you didn't. So there I was, and I had a heavy backpack, and I put it uh, out. There was no place to hide it. It was under a big uh, freeway light. And I looked for a place to eat, and the nearest place was the Howard Johnson's about two blocks away. I was not going to be able to carry my backpack. I was seeing spots before my eyes, literally. So I thought, I, I can walk there. If I'm careful, I can walk there. But I set down my backpack, and then I walked slowly to the Howard Johnson's. I went in there. I drank about five glasses of ice water. And even though in those days I was a vegetarian, I ordered fried chicken. I was so, you know, and so I, I was, and I was ready to eat my first bite of chicken. And what came to me was, I knew, and I knew that I knew that my backpack was being stolen at that moment. I knew it. I don't know how I knew it, but I just knew also it was two blocks away, and I didn't have the strength to do anything about it. It was too far away. So I just said, thank you, God, thank you, God, thank you, God. And I visualized, just to, just to kind of put an anchor to it, I visualized a 30-foot tall Jesus standing by the, the, the lamp stand, the lamp uh, in, the, in the backpack. And then I went back to my chicken, I had a leisurely dinner, I had dessert, and I walked back and there was my backpack. And I thought, well, my goodness, I must have just, you know, it was, must have been heat stroke. You know, I was worried about it. And then I heard somebody yelling, and it was about a block away, there was a construction site, and this guy came down, met me halfway in the field, and he told me that somebody had pulled over in a pickup truck and was starting to load my backpack into the back of their pickup truck, and of course it was, how was I going to go anywhere if I didn't have it? And they chased him off, they, sh they scared him off. And uh, the guy said, I don't know, I was just working, I did, something told me to turn around. <laughs> I just had the feeling, turn around, and, and I thanked him, and it was wonderful. Thank you, God, thank you, God, thank you, God, together. Thank you, God, thank you, God, thank you, God. Now, you give thanks regardless of the circumstances. You give thanks, you move into this. It's a now moment experience. God can only answer prayers in the now, because there is ultimately only the now. But how do you get into the now? Well, saying thank you, God, automatically puts you in the now automatically puts you in the receptive mode. It puts you in the now moment. Uh, Eric Butterworth wrote, Much prayer is self-defeating because it gets involved in time. A prayer that something will be done or will be prevented. Don't pray that you will get work or you will solve a problem. Affirm that you are now employed in the creative flow and that your employment is now established. Don't pray that you'll get over your cold. Give thanks that you are one with the healing, perfect life now. Feel that result so strongly that you actually find yourself feeling grateful. It's that gratitude that moves you into the now moment. And it's almost like you pull the answer out of the future into the now. You pull the answer, but you also let things be. You don't dictate. You just move with it. His widow, uh, Olga, shared a story with me, and she said that he never told, talked about his, himself or his life at all there at Lincoln Center in his services and wrote about him in his books. So she told me the story, so it, it never had been shared. Um, and it was when he was in the Great Depression, he was eight years old, his father was a gambling addict and his mother was a unity minister in um, Long Beach, California. And um, his father would abandon them penniless, take all the money and, and, and it was, he'd be gone for months at a time. And during one of those times, they didn't have any money. Um, his mother, the way they got through the Great Depression was, his mother would go through neighborhoods that had mansions in them, the richest neighborhoods in Long Beach, and would uh, uh, find 
an abandoned, because there were, because of the Depression, there were abandoned mansions where nobody was living in them. And then the, uh, she would find, go to the courthouse, find the owner of record, contact the owner of record, and then make a deal with them. Me and my three children will live in this house rent free, but we'll take care of everything for you and make sure that it's, you know, everything's groomed and everything's taken care of and that it's safe and it's not vandalized. And so we got to grow up with the best education because those schools and those wealthy neighborhoods had the best public schools. So there they were, they were destitute, they'd run out of food at a certain point, they'd run out of all the money they had except for a few pennies. And um, he was eight years old and, and he, he said to his mom, Mom, get out a basket, let's get the pennies. And they put the pennies in the basket, he says, let's throw them up in the air and bless them. And when they reach the sky, they're in the kingdom of heaven. When they come back down, they'll be multiplied. And so let's say a prayer. So they blessed the pennies and then threw them up and then caught them. And the moment the doorbell rang, the next door neighbor who was quite wealthy was having a dinner party, but the guests, not all of them showed up. And afterwards sent over their servants with terrines, silver plates, filled with food that was still warm, and they ate a feast. It was at that moment. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Together. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Move with this. Move into that moment. Move into that consciousness of gratitude that is unconditional, that doesn't need things to change for you to be grateful, that allows things to be because this is all you really have. Works with the weather. What temperature would you like it to be? <laughs> what temperature is your ideal temperature? We had a discussion in our family. Um, my ideal temperature is 66. My son's is about 74. Lynn's is 87. <laughs> when I married her, I was living in Florida. She said that was a great advantage. I don't know why she stayed with me, but anyway. <laughs> And, okay, so that's the temperature out there. Now, you can't control that. But what temperature would you like it to be in here? What temperature would I like it to be in here, so to speak? And then generate that temperature through what? Well, that's meditation. On Tuesday night in our silent meditation, that's what I said at 6 o'clock, to the group that was there, now generate the temperature that you would like it to be out there, because it was a cold night, in here, imagine not just the physical warmth, but what would you like out there and create it in here? Because in here is all you ever got. It's the only thing you're ever going to have. It's the only thing you can ever bring to life. It's the only thing you're ever going to use to change conditions. And it's the only thing you'll ever use to accept conditions as they are. And so what is your internal temperature? Move with that. Move with that. Grow with that. Be with that. Let it be. And don't expect conditions to change in order for your internal temperature to change. And that's up to you. There's a wonderful affirmation that was written by Emma Curtis Hopkins, who was the person who in Chicago, Illinois, in the 1880s, ordained Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, the founders of Unity. And then went on 40 years later to ordain the founders of religious science, the Centers for Spiritual Living, uh, Fenwick and Ernest Holmes. And she had the most wonderful affirmation, which is, this too is good, this too is God, this too is for me, and I demand to see the blessing in it. This too is good, this too is God, this too is for me, and I demand to see the blessing in it. Together? This too is good, this too is God, this too is for me, and I demand to see the blessing in it. Wow, what do you do with that? This too is good. This too is God. This too is for me. And I demand to see the blessing in it. Taking the situation and <coughs> deciding that whatever that circumstance is, you let it be, but you are defining your internal experience of it. You are defining it. James Little Freeman, I once heard him talk about a visionary experience he had while he was meditating, half sleeping, half meditating, half awake. I guess that's three halves, but whatever. So, and he was lying in, in the room that he wrote all his writings. And he was lying there, and he, he was in a reverie, and he asked the question, God, why, infinite and all-powerful, why 
is the world the way it is? And he said, I went into a visionary experience where I saw the perfect, I heard, I, I felt the word look, and I saw perfect galaxies in perfect space, perfect planets, the perfect earth, and the perfect world with the perfect lion and the perfect, with the perfect lamb, and perfect conditions with perfect people in it, and perfect everything. And he said, and as I, at first, it seemed pleasing, and then I felt like something was terribly wrong. And I was rushing around in this world, trying to find something, I didn't know what it was, and it was myself. I couldn't find myself in this world. Mm -hmm. And then, it came to me, look. And I opened my eyes, and I saw my dingy room, it was, uh, it was uh, a winter, it was cold outside, the, there, there, there was dirt on the windows, the carpet was kind of dingy, his desk was beat up, and, and he, what is it I'm seeing? This is the world I made with you in it. What can be more perfect than that? And what could be more perfect indeed? Oh, I'm going to change my whole idea of what makes me grateful. I'm going to change my whole idea of perfection. I'm going to change my whole idea of what I need in order to be satisfied, at peace, filled with joy. I'm going to change my idea. I'm going to change what I bring to life. You know, even, even uh, the, I, I brought this up at the first service. Uh, I remember when I, uh, in the, about 1982, I flew to Cancun, and I spent a week at a resort, and I was going to fly back, but about three hours before I was going to enter the plane, an amoeba got me, you know what I mean? And I was thinking, how am I going to go back on this plane? Because they had 737 jets, which were not designed for five-hour flights. They were short hop jets with only two bathrooms in the bank. And it very cramped. And I thought, how am I going to make it through? You should have seen the lines in that thing. So I just, I, I got in there, I put my head down, and I just, the five hours, thank you God, thank you God, thank you God, together. Thank you God, thank you God, thank you God. When I arrived at Los Angeles International Airport, I was hungry and healthy. That attitude, that consciousness generated something. It is, it is our choice, it is our privilege, it is our joy to bring our consciousness, that kingdom of heaven consciousness, into the circumstances and so increase the good. So this is our opportunity to do that right now. So I want you to join with me, take a deep breath and move into this moment and with a consciousness of gratitude, just, just silently just say, whatever feelings I have, thank you, God. Whatever <coughs> thoughts I experience, thank you, God. Whatever my body may be doing, thank you, God. Taking my moods, my feelings, my conditions of life, and moving back into the observer that just unconditionally says, I am so grateful. I am so blessed. My soul is satisfied. My soul is grateful. My soul is blessed. Thank you, God. In the conditions in which I find myself exactly as they are, I generate I experience this gratitude simply by letting things be and allowing th things to be exactly as they are and stepping back and saying thank you, thank you, thank you and oh yes, thank you, thank you again I am grateful, I am so grateful the condition of my heart changes. My energy changes. And if I am patient, the conditions of my life change. Thank you, God. So I'm going to take a deep, grateful breath and let it out, setting aside anything in your hands so that it doesn't disturb you. And just take another deep breath and let it out. And move into this present now moment, knowing that everything that you need is provided for you. Again, setting aside whatever's in your hands and 
moving into this presence with open hands, open hearts, open minds. Gratitude is not liking or disliking anything. It is just saying, I am grateful. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Being the witness, the observer of life, and just bringing our gratitude to life exactly as it is. Allow yourself to move into the deeper awareness, a deeper silence, silence of body, quieting your body. Quieting your thoughts. Quieting your emotions and recognizing that you are the witness of your life. And as you watch your life, the conditions of life, you just say thank you, thank you, thank you, God. And bring your gratitude as the yeast enters into the dough and increases the good expanding the good, giving thanks as Jesus did when he blessed the bread and the fish and it just multiplied. Letting everything be as it is and saying thank you changes the conditions of life because it changes you. Whatever is going on around me, I am grateful within my soul. I am so grateful within my soul. Because no matter what is happening to me, divine love is flowing through me. My joy, my happiness is not dependent upon conditions or circumstances. My joy, my experience of life is the gratitude that I bring to it. a sense of peace and equanimity. I bear witness to my life. I observe my feelings. I observe my thoughts. I observe the conditions of life. And I just sit in gratitude generating that sense of thankfulness. That great gratitude. Letting go of the need for things to be different than they are to experience that gratitude. My soul is enough for me. I am satisfied in my soul. My soul is sufficient. I am grateful in my soul. And I allow the conditions of life to shift as needed. Life because 
I am my soul. I do not wait for circumstances to bring me anything. I generate this energy and this power here and now. And I rest for a moment in silence. Thank you, God, that in this moment, everything is full, everything is whole, everything is complete, because I declare it to be so, because I am grateful, because I am, and so it is. You know, Thanksgiving was giving thanks in the midst of uh, circumstances that were a little wonky. Uh, the pilgrims only had pumpkin to eat, and that's the true story, and there's actually a hymn that they used to sing in honor of the pumpkin, which was the only thing they had to eat until the Native Americans showed up with some other things. And it went like this. Uh, the melody has been lost, but the lyrics were, we have pumpkin in the morning, we have pumpkin every noon. If it was not for the pumpkin, we would all be undue. And now, um, as our offering statement, we're, um, we're going to prepare for it by listening to the words of Emily Cady. There was something about the mental act of thanksgiving that will carry your mind far beyond the region of doubt into the clear atmosphere of faith and trust where all things are possible. So I give in gratitude and I receive abundantly. Together, I give in gratitude and I receive abundantly and silently. And again aloud together. I give in gratitude and I receive abundantly. And so it is.